When you dare to share, you break the silence. When you dare to share, you speak your truth. When you dare to share, you use the full strength of your voice. When you dare to share, it brings opportunity to own your story. So tell it, be heard, and at the same time, your sharing is someone else's learning, inspiration, motivation, empowerment, and hope. There's always an element to each of our stories that remains a secret. For some, we feel it's a dirty little secret. Dare to Share Your Untold Story exposes these secrets in a welcoming and positive way. I encourage each of you out there to dare yourself to share what is yours to tell. When we dare, it is the courage to do something really important. Let this be a vow to each and every single one of us that we take risk, we brave, confront, and face what is, while inspiring and empowering all communities. So let's break that silence and tap into mental beauty. This is Salima Jadavji, your podcast host, a practicing clinical social worker, and your mental wellness connoisseur. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast, episode number 38. She was introduced to the foster care system, and the quest for questions began. To all my fellow listeners, before we get started, I'm just dropping in a note to give you a heads up that this podcast might be emotionally triggering for you. We do invite guests onto the show who share openly about extremely difficult life moments with exposure and impact of what the struggles have been like. The intensity of each episode could have a variable impact on your emotional and mental well-being based on your own personal story. If at any point the topic becomes uncomfortable or upsetting to you in any way, please do not pressure yourself to listen. Instead, be kind to yourself, do some self-care, and perhaps give another episode a try. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our amazing and daring guest, Felicia Carty. Felicia was born and raised in Calgary, Alberta, and she now lives and works in Toronto, Ontario. She is the child of an Afro-Caribbean mother and a Sri Lankan father. Felicia attended the University of Toronto and Centennial College for Journalism and holds minor degrees in studio art and philosophy. She has since written articles for interest magazines and has worked in communications in the nonprofit sector. Most recently, Felicia has turned her attention to long-form writing receiving two merit scholarships from Humber College's School of Creative Writing. Her blended dysphoric roots have become part of the focus of her current work in a memoir titled The Pigeon's Eggs, is set to be released in March 2022. When she is not working, Felicia enjoys exploring the city on her bike, experimenting with desserts and meals in the kitchen, and finding the latest comedy, special, or TV series to watch while she's working out. Well, hello, Felicia. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, my goodness, Felicia. It is so fabulous that I get to chat with you today. I am both excited and eager to learn more about your untold story. And you know, Felicia, I also want to express how thankful I am that you are willing to talk about something so personal and share deeper pockets of your story. I'm also grateful for your support in taking a stance to help break barriers of mental stigma. Wonderful. I'm I'm glad that you're doing this. I'm glad to be a part of it. So that's wonderful. You know, in case you're still wondering, Felicia, this podcast, you know, it's all about bringing forward untold stories that people go through. And what I mean by this is that people, whatever struggle or strife they have in life, uh, whether it's directly about a mental health issue or something else, no matter what the story is, there's always impact to our mental health. And that's the one part of the story that often remains tucked away. So I will, I have hope that this platform that I've created here will serve in a way to break those barriers of mental stigma that have been conditioned in our society. So I'm hoping together we will tag team today And really encourage people to share and tell or inspire them to share and tell, just as you are today, what people typically have reservations for expressing. 
and unveiling. And of course, I'm bringing forward a trend. It's called the mental beauty rethink. What are your thoughts about mental beauty? Um, You know, this is so interesting to me um, because when I think about something that is beautiful, um, I think about what makes it unique. And so oftentimes when we we speak about mental health, um, even the word health, it suggests a spectrum, right? From good Mm -hmm. to bad. Um, We think about health, we think about you know, being closer to alive or closer to death, where are you Mm -hmm. on that? Um, And so I think we tend to view ourselves as in this battle Mm -hmm. for health, um, where we can be doing better or for Mm -hmm. worse. And I think that really sucks, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Um, And so when I think about mental beauty, on the other hand, it makes me think about just loving yourself for where you are at the moment. Yes, You know, you can be in shackles in a psych ward uh, you could be you know going through maybe the darkest days of your life or the happiest but it's just the appreciation of your mind and the potential that it has mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um you know whenever I think about you know just being in the moment there is this ability to have gratitude right and you know having just gratitude for your mind doesn't just mm-hmm the power to like change your life but it it just allows you to simply to live and to simply be so um hats off to you into mental beauty and just to loving your unique self no matter where you where you are I guess the idea for me was that the notion of embracing mental beauty would be the next way that we could see mental health right that it's all encompassing uh no matter what spectrum that we're on what part of the spectrum that we're on as you were mentioning and I agree, you know, when I think of things that are beautiful, I, I often think of them from the from the lens of the uniqueness. And to step it forward, I believe that when you, I guess the premise of this podcast is that when you dare to share, you are breaking that silence. You are speaking up. You are speaking your truth. You're using your voice. And by doing all of that, you are inspiring others to do that. So again, part of that spectrum or the cycle, it's just... A, a continuum that we get to be awesome. on, right? I love it. Thank you. I am excited uh, that I got to hear your take on mental beauty. Uh-huh. Thank you so much. Now, are you all set for the conversation that we're about to embark on? <laughs> I'm as set as I can be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well then, Felicia, give us the newspaper headline of how you would title your untold story. How? Would it read? All right. When I was six years old, I was taken from my mother and placed in foster care. And there began the journey of understanding why. Okay. So you were taken from your mom at age six. And that's when your journey began of yes. looking, looking to understand more about it. Yes. Okay. So can you say a little bit more about what comes up? when you say this title out loud, like what comes up for you? Any, any thoughts or any, any um, inklings? Sure. So I will start off by saying, um, having written a book about this whole journey, um, as soon as I say that headline, I am kind of have this feeling of being taken through the whole journey. And it was a Mm -hmm. lot. Um, it not only affected my childhood, it has impacted my adult life dramatically. And, you know, I would say that when I was younger, I was completely unaware about how this would impact me post foster care. Um, I Mm -hmm. actually thought I was just going to amalgamate into the world and be just like everyone else. Right. And that has really not been the case. Right. So not really having an idea of what would carry forward when you sort of broke free from post foster care life. Yes. And, you know, I won't I won't only say that, you know, further to our mental beauty, that it's it's been a hard journey, but it's it's been a beautiful one. Of course that there's, there must have been ebbs and flows and wonderful moments as well as intense moments. And 
unknowns, lots of unknowns, right? And some of the surprises mm-hmm. may have been pleasant and maybe some of them not so much. Yeah, there's this yeah. notion of, you know, I, I uh, identify as a Christian and there's, there's this notion in Christianity where, you know, you don't so much strive for happiness, but you strive for joy, which isn't so dependent on, you know, your day-to-day you know, whether you have a smile on your face or things are going well, it's about living a purposeful life and a meaningful life. You find the joy in, in whatever yeah, the moment Yeah, and is. like in, the, in the, the deeper kind of rivers, you know, of where your life is taking you, you know, I, I do find a lot of meaning and purpose in what I've chosen to do with my life and where I've come from. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us more about what your untold story is all about, Felicia? Yes, yes, for sure. So when I was small, I lived with my mom and my two older brothers. One is a year older than me and the other is four years older than me. And we lived in a basement apartment in a bit of a rough neighborhood in Calgary. Mm -hmm. And as I got older, I began to notice some things about my mother that just seemed a bit strange to me. So when we would, you know, be outside, uh, she would be antagonistic towards strangers. You know, people couldn't say hello to us. Um, She would become a bit like irritated and even aggressive towards them. Like she never, you know, put her hands on anybody, but she would like yell no. Yeah, she would, um, you know, hide me and my brother's you know, hide her faces with her hands. Mm-hmm. And um, it began to make me feel very uncomfortable. And, you know, it was it was not a pleasant experience. There are many, you know, separate instances that I remember very vividly um, not feeling good about. Mm-hmm. And so we didn't actually leave the house very often at all. Um, I can tell you that when I was six years old, the only other home I remember ever going to, aside from our own, was my dad's girlfriend. And mm-hmm. even in that situation, he kind of snuck us over there. Um, but other than that, we we didn't have any like family friends. I didn't have any little friends. Um, you know, we had these this very secluded life. Um, and I was. Would you say it was isolating a little? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I was, you know, six years old. I was really curious about the world. I mm-hmm. used to love when my dad would come and get us and he would take us on the bus and, you know, show us the city. It was just, you know, sparkling lights for me. It was so exciting for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so by the time I was going to school, I was really excited. I was excited just to be like my brothers and to be going to school, but I was excited to leave the house and to see something new and maybe to, to make some friends. And so about a month into, uh, when I started going to school, I was in class one day and my teacher called my name and there was a lady at the door and she said to go with the lady. And I went and I was taken to an office of the school and there were two other children in this office and they turned out to be my older brothers. Mm-hmm. And the lady came to me and she knelt in front of me and she said, how would you feel if I told you you weren't going home? And I was so excited. And I said to her, we're going on a field trip. And I looked at my brothers and I was like, hello, why aren't you more excited? And they just were just like, oh, Felicia doesn't get it again. I just, I was the last one to always figure things out. And the lady said, mm-hmm no, how would you feel if I told you you weren't going home for a long time? So the way they even said it was very vague and and open. Yes. Yes. mm -hmm. Um, But what ended up happening is we uh, went into a car and we drove out of the city and we ended up in a small town where we stayed for the rest of the year with our first foster family. Did anyone explain to you that this is a foster family? So I will say that it was very small. And so I don't remember very much. What I do remember them telling me was that in that office, they said there was a girl there and she's your age. And 
I was so excited to have a sister, Mm -hmm. but I don't know if I knew the word foster home or foster care or anything like that. Did you ask about your mom or did you get to see her at any point? No. So when we're in the office, I did not ask about my mom. When we were living at the home, we would go to visit her sometimes on Sundays. However, we were explicitly told not to tell us, tell her, you know, the name of our school, what town we were living in, or the last Mm -hmm. name of the family that we were living with, because she could potentially find us. How did you feel about that when you were told not to share those details with your mom? You know what? I was a little clueless as a kid. And so I didn't feel Mm -hmm. anything. It, It was, those were just the roles. And I would also say that because I had started to feel like my mom was not like other parents, that Mm -hmm. I didn't exactly feel entirely empathetic towards her already. Like I thought my mom looked a little strange. She behaved a little strange. I sort of thought she was mean because of how she would interact with people on the outside. Keep in mind, Mm -hmm. I was also a really sensitive kid. And so I was actually very Mm -hmm. attached to my mom at the same time. Um, You know, I was scared of everything. I think especially because we were so sheltered by her and guarded. Um, And so it was Mm -hmm. this weird combination of like really needing her and being uncomfortable with her at the same time. And I I remember at that first house, um, my my foster sister um, one day asked me, what it was like, like what my mom was like, what my home was like. And it was the first time I remember actually really stopping and thinking about that. And, you know, I told her about my mom and I actually said that, you know, she's, my mom had health issues, which made her gain weight in a strange way. And so I said, Mm -hmm. you know, she's really bad and she's mean. And, you know, this is another theme in my book. She's really dark like my oldest right. brother who is my my middle brother and myself we are mixed race and my older brother is full black and it was just okay. like this um feeling that I had that my mom was this kind of monster and um you know she, my foster sister looked so hurt <laughs> that I said that about my mom oh. and I think you know seeing her and when I was young, you know, growing up in Calgary, I really looked up to white girls. And so I really revered my foster sister because she was blonde and she had colored eyes. Um, Mm -hmm. And so when I, Mm -hmm. when I saw that she could have empathy for my mother was actually the moment that I said that I could have empathy for my mother as well. And that I would never, and I I never looked at my mom like that again in such a derogatory Mm -hmm. way. And I never spoke about her like that. Mm -hmm. So changed after having that conversation with your foster sister, how old would you have been by then? So I was in the first grade, so I would have been six years old. And, you know, there remained this mystery then about what was wrong with my mother and why we weren't with her. We were with that family for that school year. And after that, we actually were going to go try to live with my father And in the car ride, a social worker came and got us. And Mm -hmm. the social worker, while we were driving off, and, you know, I will say I was very heartbroken that we did not end up staying with this Mm -hmm. family. Um, But the social worker said, do you understand there's something, your mother is sick? And my brother said, yes. And of course, I was like, she is? She's sick? Like, she has a cold? And Mm. he said, no, in her head. And I still didn't understand. I had no idea what to make of that. Right. Right. And so we were, we ended up being with our dad for about nine months and that didn't work out either. And we were sent to a different home. And this was the home that I would end up staying in for another 10 years and where I would learn a lot about my mother and her history and what had happened to her because the lady that we ended up living with actually knew my mother's family 
in the Caribbean. They grew up on the same island. Okay. They're from Antigua. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, so that is when I made all all the discoveries. And um, all the discoveries. Yes. So did you ever find out if your mother got diagnosed or treated? Um, you said that she suffered from schizophrenia. And of course, you didn't know that when you were younger. But do you know now if, if she ever got diagnosed or treated? I know my mother has spent time in a psychiatric ward in a hospital. I can only say one time. And Mm -hmm. this is something that I learned in my adult years because the visitations with my mother would be on and off. And oftentimes I didn't know why we had stopped seeing her. But when I was older, my foster mom said that towards the end of our time with my dad, when we stopped seeing Mm -hmm. my mother, it was because she had become suicidal. And so when you were at your second foster family's home, where you spent the remainder of your time with that family and during foster care, what was it like to be with a family that kind of knew your family? It was amazing. Let me tell you, I was mm-hmm. so excited to learn about that. I even had a history and a family history. Um yeah. You know, it felt as though everyone else had these cool lives and like grandparents and, you know, family friends. And, you know, it was just something we didn't have. Mm -hmm. And she told us the story of my family. And unfortunately, it was not the nicest story. My my mother and her sisters had a very hard life and Mm -hmm. they were extremely poor. Mm -hmm. And so. I didn't know anything about my family from my mother. I didn't know very much about my mother from my mother. I'm pretty sure I didn't even know my family was in Tegan until I got to that second foster house. You know, I never had, I've never had a conversation with my mom. And I, this is all because of some of the uh, symptoms of her illness. She just kind of lost her language. And so staying with this family, learning about your family, were there any particular relatives that you connected well with or that you got to spend time with? Did anyone fit that role? So I generally throughout my childhood and even into my adult years have had a bit of an estranged relationship with my mother's family. And um, Mm -hmm. I think the time that we really got to spend with them at first was when they Mm -hmm. actually came to Calgary for my mother's funeral. For your mother's funeral? Yes. So my mother ended up passing away when I was 12. Did you get to see your mom before she passed away? Like, were you in, was there any involvement uh, between your foster family and and your mom at that point? So here's the thing about my foster mother. My foster mom is very principled and, um, she is definitely an advocate for women and for black women. Um, and so my foster mother uh, does not have any sort of stigma towards people who have like mental health issues or especially to like black women. And she is a nurse. And so she understands that the health system is not the greatest um, necessarily for, you know, people of color. And so she was right. very empathetic towards my mother and she made it mm-hmm. a point that we were going to have an active relationship with her and that our mother was going to be in our lives. And this is, it was wonderful um, because it kind of relieved some of the sadness that I had for my mom. Um, but at the same time, mm-hmm. it was difficult because I had a very complicated relationship with my mom. Um, I, mm-hmm. there was a lot of shame about who she was, about her mental illness, about how she looked on the street, right. about how she would behave, mm-hmm. about the color of her mm-hmm. skin, about her size. Right. Right. And I can actually tell you that, you know, I had a lot of shame growing up. I, the first thing I really remember feeling shameful about was not being white. Um, it took Mm -hmm. me a while to get really comfortable with the fact that I was part black. 
Right. I can actually remember being in eighth grade and finally understanding that I felt comfortable that I wasn't white, mm-hmm. that I, you know, I thought being black was kind of cool actually. And what had happened was um, when we first went to our foster home, uh, we right. were going to church with them. And the church that we went to was predominantly black. It wasn't very multicultural okay. at all. And I felt mm-hmm. very much like an outsider. <laughs> so as much as I felt okay. like an outsider, you know, at school being the non-white kid, Um, Going to a black Mm -hmm. church was equally as uncomfortable. Um, But I Mm -hmm. guess, you know, I didn't behave the way that they did. And it was always so confusing for me because I was like, we're all in Calgary. How how are you behaving Mm -hmm. any differently than me? But, you know, it was because they, there were these kids who grew up in like West Indian homes. Right. And so they had like an understanding of our culture that being with my mother who didn't really talk at all. I didn't have up with a white family for a bit than my Sri Lankan dad. Mm-hmm. Right. So I just wasn't as informed about our culture. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was actually when we started, we switched churches um, just to go to a church that was closer to us. And this church was just more multicultural. And there were mm-hmm. um, mixed race children there. And, mm-hmm. you know, I just felt like I just fit in more. I just started to get a lot more Mm -hmm. comfortable. And it was then that I could start embracing more of my identity, you know, and there was a lot, a lot of, um, you know, different shame that I kind of carried, you know, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't nice to tell people in Calgary that you were, you were Brown, you were going to be called Packy. They were not to say that anyone from any culture or country should you know have to deal with any kind of stigma but I knew that no one was going to separate me from them like Sri Lankan from Pakistani they no one was going to do that Mm -hmm. and it wasn't actually until I was in 12th grade in high school that I said to my friends that my dad is from Sri Lanka and but it wasn't actually until I came to to Toronto when after I graduated high school that I started embracing the fact that I'm half brown. It it sounds so ridiculous because I was so old. I was Mm -hmm. 18 when I started feeling comfortable being with my, my culture. But that is part of the reason I suppose why I left Calgary in the first place, because I was just tired of not fitting in. Right. And that's interesting because I was going to ask you what inspired you to, for you to move to Toronto. Was it that you were just tired or was there more? Oh, there was definitely more. Uh, Mm -hmm. During our trip when we were kids, when we came and we stayed with our aunts and my foster family needed to pick up some of their furniture, I remember seeing the city and just, you know, I I would say it was the same feeling that some people have about like New York or LA. Like you go there to Mm -hmm. make a new life. I had that feeling about Toronto. Mm -hmm. It was a seed that was planted that never left. And I, you know, when I, when I was in that second foster home that I was in for a long time, you know, things right. weren't easy there. It was lovely to say that I got along so well with my foster parents and my mother was very overbearing and um, mm-hmm. you know, it was with love, but when you're with an overbearing parent, who's not your mother, um, it's very difficult. And my foster dad was pretty, um, he was a pretty grouchy guy. And it's one thing to have a grouchy parent when you are their actual child, but when you're not their child and you have gone through, you know, this cycle of homes that we went through, you just feel unwanted. Right. Well, it makes you feel like you're walking on eggshells, right? Like, I definitely grew up walking on eggshells. Yeah, you can't express fully what you want to express or just allow yourself to spread out the way you want to spread out. Like, you know, even if you're hanging out in, in on, on the sofa, right? You're probably, I mean, I imagine you you must have always made sure you were sitting okay. And when they called you, you, you had to stop whatever you were doing, even if it interrupted your academics to, to go and answer a question or to do some sort of a chore. Right. <laughs> I remember there was one time my foster mother called me and 
um, she said to me, I came up the stairs and I, I remember purposefully slowing down as I came up the stairs. So I didn't come up the stairs properly. She was going to make me do the stairs again. Oh um, my. Okay. And some of these things, <laughs> some of these things I will admit, I actually kind of appreciate because she really wanted to refine us, sure. right? We had not had any kind of, you know, brought up <laughs> you know, as they would say, as Caribbean <laughs> right. people would say. Right. But yeah, you know, it was, it, my parents, they did not play around. It was a very strict household. Right. And, you know, with my, my foster dad, mm-hmm. he, his temper was so extreme. It was actually worse than my dad's. My dad had a very bad temper, temper as well. Mm-hmm. And um, it was to the point where I could, I would listen out for signs of him. Right. So like his slippers shuffling across the floor. Um, you know, the sound of the garage door, like anything, I was so hyper aware right. of, you know, where he was in the house and what was happening. And I have a really great relationship with my foster parents today. Yeah. I'm so grateful that, you know, we worked through a really a difficult time, especially mm-hmm. post-care. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As I'm sure you can understand, that could be, you know, growing up that way, I was quite enthusiastic about leaving right um but that's not to say I wanted to cut them off or anything I just wanted my freedom you can you can be enthusiastic to move forward and have that fresh start but I'm sure you look back with gratitude and the connection and bond is is something unique for for you for for all of you yeah it is definitely um I think the the main thing I try to like if there's something that I I think is important to say is that you know, foster relationships are unique and I know all Mm -hmm. relationships require work, but I think the Mm -hmm. nature of leaving care and um, continuing a relationship and both being on the same page about like what you mean to each other, it does require a lot of work. There are a lot of unknowns, you know what I mean? And um, certainly when I was coming out of care, there was not a good understanding of what our expectations were for each other. And I, Mm -hmm. again, like grateful that I would even say I was the one who continued to initiate creating a healthy relationship. Right. When our dad died, it was, you know, I was going back, of course, to bury him and my brother was coming as well, but he was going to be staying with our foster family who he hadn't spoken to in over a decade. Um, How old were you when your father died? My father died when I was 25. And so, I mean, I'm sure it must have been so difficult to bury him and and to go back to to Calgary to give him his last rites. Can you say more about how you were impacted by his death as as a part of your post-foster care journey? When I had come out of foster care and I came to Toronto, I knew that I was going to be visiting my father regularly, which meant yearly. But so I had, you know, kept in contact with my dad and it was Mm -hmm. a very, it was a very hard time for me because I had a lot of guilt about being away from him when he was so not doing so well. And it kind of sucked a bit of the joy out of being away and, you know, having a new life and and going to school. And there was this guilt that came with it. And for a long time, I actually said to myself that when I finished school, I was going to go back home and look after my dad. And I said it sort of knowing that it was a bit of a lie Mm -hmm. because I didn't see a life for myself back in Calgary um, I had left because I wanted to leave that part of my life behind. Right. And I also felt like my dad was a bit undeserving of having me give up my new life because he had been so um, inconsistent in absence when we were children. And this is mm-hmm. part of the reason why we couldn't end up staying with him was because my dad, who struggles with alcohol, just started disappearing on us when we lived with him. 
uh, for days right. sometimes. And um, oftentimes when he was there, he was inebriated, you know, to the point where he wasn't able to like get up and go to the washroom. I think very quickly when I was young, when we went to our, that second foster home that we were with, um, mm -hmm. that I was with mm -hmm. until I aged out of care, I actually mm -hmm. forgave my dad very quickly. And I just mm -hmm. stopped seeing him as this, you know, amazing. I used to be so in love with my dad when I was little, like, you know, many mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. He was that Disney dad. He was fun. He had these funny stories. Mm -hmm. um, but he was just not able to to care for us. And I, I think I got, I under, started to understand that very quickly. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I never held anything against him or anything like that. And I think as I got older, I just started seeing the reality of who he was and his flaws and whatnot. Yeah, I think the, so here's the, the next complicated thing is that another part of the reason why I felt like it sort of justified me not going back home when I finished school to take care of him was that mm -hmm. my oldest brother who had come to Toronto before me he actually, in my last year of university, um, was diagnosed with schizophrenia. I couldn't leave him. I know it sounds selfish, but it felt like I couldn't get a break. Right. Well, it's like a repeat all over again. Exactly. You know, from the time we were children, um, he was forced to just grow up so quickly. When we lived with our father, he really had to take a role in taking care of me and our middle brother because our dad was so absent. So to have, and he was also, a, you know, and still is a very, very bright guy. He was on his own, you know, in high school. And through all that, he still managed to get into the University of Toronto. Right. And so to have this happen to him, it was so, it was heartbreaking for me. Of course. It's definitely difficult to be in the in the witness seat, right? You know, it it really, yes. really is. And I think something that was really important for me to understand is just that how much I needed to give myself grace mm -hmm. for having feelings of wanting to have an easier life. And you know, I was always kind of like, am I trying to like wish away? my brother, am I trying to wish away my dad? Am I going to, are these feelings me wanting to wish away, you know, my mother? I remember, right. you know, when I was small and my mother died, there was a part of me that felt really guilty for feeling kind of relieved, but mm -hmm. you don't really understand that at 12 years old. No, you, it's hard to understand it at any age, let alone at age 12 and let alone with all of the other um, hoops and loops that you had to go through, right? Mm -hmm. So Felicia, you know, when people come to see me for therapy, you know, individuals are typically in one of three places when they're wanting to work on uh, a big part of their journey. Some people are getting started. They don't really know what they need to work on or where they have to start or, or what what is the um the main triggers or where is the story beginning and for some they're in the middle right in the middle navigating what's uh sort of tumult they're dealing with and some people are looking back looking back in different ways maybe looking back to make connections or understand things better in in retrospect or or people are looking for closure or they're able to now want to get into a place to introspect and reflect so they can move forward um, where in the journey would you say that you are? Would you say you're looking back in the middle or getting started? That's a really great question. I feel as though there are some things that I'm looking back on, some things that I have not even started. Um, I would say that maybe in general, I'm mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle. I know that there's a lot of work that I need to do because I see signs of it mm -hmm. in my life. It's very hard for me to speak about my mother and the experiences that she went through. Mm -hmm. It's very painful. Mm -hmm. It's very triggering. And I would like to get 
to a place where I can speak about it a bit more objectively and not feel like I'm a little girl. Yeah. There's more healing to be done. And, and with the healing, you get to integrate, you get to integrate your feelings. You get to integrate all of the different thoughts and everything that's coming up. You know, you you've integrated when you're able to talk about it without feeling the pain so intensely. Yes. So Felicia, what is your key message to the listeners of our show? So, so I think instead of maybe addressing all the listeners, I would really want to address foster kids or former wars, people who have transitioned out of foster care. And I would say that, you know, I I often, I think we don't often hear stories about people who are in care or were in care. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they end up in such precarious life situations. You know, if even if you look at the statistics about, you know, not graduating from high school or ending up you know, in a single, as a single parent, um, sometimes, you know, they just don't end up in a situation where they have the, the novelty and the, you know, the agency to be able to, to do things like tell their story. And I, I wish someone had emphasized this to me when I was leaving care, really aim to cling to any kind of stability that you can find, you know, and be very careful about leaving a stable situation, whether it's a home, a job, relationships that you have that are with solid, stable people, you need that in your life because everyone has that in their life Mm -hmm. and it makes their lives work. And I would also say, um, Mm -hmm. always open your heart to, to love again. I, I think mm-hmm. that foster children and former foster children have a lot of abandonment issues often, you know, but closing yourself off completely is not going to help your life get better. Your life becomes more rich and um, you have more help. If you, you know, learn about relationships, um, learn how you can do better in relationships and continue to actively seek them out. And the last thing that I would say is have fun. I mean. I spent so much of my life planning on how I'm going to make things work that I feel like I let a lot of the flowers go by without being smelled, (laughs) right? So um, everyone else is having fun. You can find ways to have fun too that, you know, of course, find ways to have fun that you feel good about the next day, right? That aren't going to turn your life upside down. Um, And I think those are the three pieces of advice I would give to to foster kids who are uh, aging out or to those who have already transitioned. So it's a wonderful, it's a beautiful message. Thank you so much for articulating that. So Felicia, I'm curious about what has been your anchor or what has been game changing for you in terms of inspiration, something that's close to you that reflects your untold story. So would there have been a mantra or a quote or a book or a, an event or a person, anything that speaks to you? Yeah, for sure. So this is something that is very recent to me. Um, I went to Calgary over this past summer. And since my father passed away, I stopped my yearly trips. Um, but I do, I have gone here and there, just not as much. And I actually had never been to his grave site and seen his um, headstone. On it is a quote from the Bible, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, I do not give you as the world gives. And the rest of the the quote from the Bible says, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And, you know, Mm -hmm. there is so much striving that we do in life. And I think part of my story is that I've had to make things work uh, largely on my own. And I think a lot of that has been me trying to find peace and to think that, Mm -hmm. you know, he now has peace. It almost felt like a message to me. His last message that he could give his daughter. That's wonderful. Uh, A really important reminder for you. And I know it hits home. It it really sits in your heart. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. 
So Felicia, what's a cause or an organization that has been impactful to you somewhere along your journey that maybe you would like to give a shout out to? Sure. So first, I just want to give a shout out to my foster family um, and even to the relatives in my mother's family who have stuck with me. I'm so grateful that they're in my life and that they've even supported my book, despite, you know, the reservations that they may have had about mm-hmm. you know, a book about them or their family. I guess, lastly, lastly, I would say, um, I want to shout out all memoir writers. Um, you know, a lot of memoirs say that they feel like releasing their story feels like the nuttiest thing that they could do. Like, I can't yeah. believe I'm telling everyone this. On the other hand, they feel like they're really compelled to do it, which is exactly how I felt. And, you know, it plays such a big role in exactly what you're doing here, which is telling stories and breaking stigma and, you know, allowing people to make connection. And I think mm-hmm. that is so important. And, you know, my hat's off to to everyone who chooses to do that. Wonderful. So shout out to the all your memoir writers as well. That's great. So, um, Felicia, guess what? No, another hour. <laughs> <laughs> You've just dared yourself to share. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, you did it. Now you can breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Felicia, I, you know, first of all, I want you to know that um, we're going to make sure all of your um, social handles that you've provided to us will be on the, the, on, on the podcast blog page. So everyone will be able to Uh, connect with you however which way they wish to if they'd like to that's going to be made available but really Felicia I am truly humbled with today's sharing really allowing yourself to get into those deeper pockets of your story and not only did you show up with so much authenticity and vulnerability you really allowed your story to be heard in a raw tender and eloquent way you really have incredible perspective and so I just want you to know that I I have learned so much from hearing your story today. And so I can only imagine that others will be learning something about themselves as well. So thank you for the deep conversation and for all of the sharing you've done. Thank you for having me again. I enjoyed my time with you. Wonderful. And once again, Felicia, thank you for being part of Dare to Share Your Untold Story and helping to be a voice in breaking down the barriers of mental stigma. To all of our listeners, if you like what you've been hearing on this podcast and you want to be part of breaking down barriers of mental stigma, I invite you to go wherever you are listening to the episode and hit subscribe. Leave us a comment or a review of the episode and maybe how you relate to it. To learn more about what we offer, visit www.daretoheal.co. And if you are feeling ready and brave to share, please submit your story by visiting www.daretoshare.co. Thanks for joining in.